I'm singing in the rain. Come on, join in. Just singing in the rain. Let's raise the roof. What a glorious feeling. I'm happy again. Oh, we need some rain, don't we? There was a time when we all used to sing. We sat around campfires at church and at school. We sang our stories and our dreams. We sang alone and we sang together. But nowadays, not many of us sing. We think we can't because at some stage someone's told us we're not good enough or we compare ourselves against the celebrities that we idolise. So I've got a question. Who here has been told by their parents, kids, teachers, anyone that they can't sing? Hands up. Fantastic. I'm not going to make you sing, don't worry. <laughs> but um, when I was 14, I desperately wanted to have singing lessons and my best girlfriend started having lessons. And so one night we went over to her place and I said, can you teach me the song that you've been learning? We sang it a few times together and then she said, I'll play the piano, you sing. She played, I sang. At the end of the song, she said, Tanya, you should never bother having singing lessons. You're not good enough. So I believed her. And the next year, I thought, well, at least I can do backstage and do the props in the school musical. And then finally, in year 11, I auditioned for the chorus of the musical Oklahoma. And to my amazement, I got the lead role. This was a defining moment for me. It taught me that you should never let anyone snatch away your dreams. But just like me, many of you have been told you can't sing or you're not creative. And many of our voices, most of our voices, have been silenced. And that's no good because our voice is the language of our hearts. It's how we express ourselves. For centuries, forever, tribes have sung and danced together to build strength and ward off their enemies. Our voice is part of our human DNA. So now, actually, for a moment, let's not sit in silence. Let's stand up for a moment and let's create a mutual Creative Mornings Harmony sound. So we're going to start off with this part of the room just here, singing, oh, hands up, all of you. And we're going to go... Ah, oh, breathing in and ah. Oh. Remember that note. We're going to come back to that. In the middle here. Ah, oh, breathing in and ah. Oh. Good. Okay, give them a clap. And some of you will have to join the top part here. And we're going to go ah, oh, breathing in and ah. Oh. Okay, putting it all together. We're gonna, we, so you're going to start your note, then keep going. If you run out of breath, breathe again. Okay. Da, da, da. And we're going to keep going for a while. After a while, I'm going to get you to close your eyes and I'm going to get you to hear all the different voices in the room that make up this incredible community. Okay, here we go. Ah, uh, keep going. Ah. Uh, Ah. Keep going. Close your eyes. Getting louder. Softer. Louder. Improvise. Wow. Okay, okay, wow. 
usually, you know, most groups like stop after a while, but you guys could have gone for like another half an hour. <laughs> that was pretty good. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was beautiful. Thank you. You can sit down. So, we were experiencing not only the incredible beauty of all your unique voices just then, but are your brains buzzing now? Because what you were experiencing then is the incredible neuroscience of singing. So, singing is like a super wonder drug. And in my TED talk, How Singing Together Changes Your Brain, I talk about the incredible neuroscientific benefits of singing. So particularly when we sing together, not just in the car or in the shower, but when we sing with others, we become happier, healthier, more creative. Our memory, language and concentration improves and we increase the neuroplasticity of our brain as we release oxytocin through the right temporal lobe of our brain. This is truly the super wonder drug. One of the other incredible and wonderful things about singing is that it connects us to the right side of our brain. And today's talk is going to be a little bit about that, about the importance of getting into the right side of our brain. The right side of our brain is responsible for our creativity, imagination, intuition. It connects us to one another and all that is. It's our human battery charger. Unfortunately, we spend most of our time in the left side of our brain, being very logical, factual, analytical. The left side of our brain separates us. It keeps us in our little boxes. It puts walls between us. Who feels overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge that's coming at them all the time? Yeah. So it's said that we spend about 85% of the time in the left side of our brain, being overwhelmed by facts and figures and staying separate from others. It's no wonder that loneliness, depression and social isolation are the global epidemic of our times. We talk more to boxes and screens than we do to one another. And it becomes fundamentally important to nurture the attributes of human beings that set us apart from machines. Love, compassion, creativity, courage, empathy, determination. And all that talking to boxes and screens means that they're becoming smarter than us in some ways. And if we keep talking to boxes and screens all the time, it's going to be really important that we really step up our creative and innovative attributes to remain relevant in a world of machines. You see those stats up there. And all of us are creative and innovative. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't think they're creative? That's good. I often speak to like roomfuls of leaders and like half the audience put up their hand and say they're not creative which is a little scary. So, Tom Attlee recently said this, I've come to believe things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster, simultaneously. Who agrees? Yeah, and we're living in this world where change is the only game in town. And it becomes fundamental to raise our collective intelligence and our collective consciousness to manage the increasing social and economic problems that we're facing. We need to really develop these six new right brain senses, design, story, symphony, empathy, play and meaning, to remain relevant in a world of machines. Also, our society and organisations and institutions have typically been run in a left-brained, linear, siloed, command and control, winner-take-all, industrial age thinking. This is epitomised by the male archetype. And I say this, gentlemen, with absolutely no element of feminism. All of us as human beings have masculine and feminine attributes in all of us. And it's up to each of us as males and females to become fully rounded and evolved human beings. And more than ever, 
we now need to develop some of these attributes of the feminine archetype, the female archetype, which is all about empowerment, which is all about sharing and collaboration and cooperation. We need to share our assets instead of the, holding them to ourselves. Because, as you can see, this masculine economy is focused on this scarcity consciousness. And this feminine is economy is focused on this abundance consciousness. And we're now moving into a world where we're on the brink of a major change, where a lot of people are going to be left behind by the pace of change. Probably not all of you in this room, you're pretty fortunate, you're well educated. But there's a lot of people who can't keep up with the pace of change. So I ask you all, what's our role gonna be going forwards? What's gonna matter? And I'd like to suggest that the most important thing for each of us is to be active, caring and sharing citizens. To foster and nurture our creativity and our entrepreneurial skills. An IBM study recently suggested that in an increasingly complex and uncertain global environment, the most important attribute will be creativity. And yet a lot of people, like I said before, say they're not creative. And they say, but how do we get creative? Well, Steve Jobs famously said, creativity is simply about connecting the dots. So that when you want to or need to get creative, you have like this rich and diverse toolbox of life experiences. So the more diverse you can make your network and your life, the more you can have what I call positive human collisions, the better. You know, we hang out with people who are very similar to us. They think like us, dress like us, similar educations and financial backgrounds, yeah? We hang out with people like us a lot, right? But our greatest gains are when we connect with people who are very diverse, who challenge us, who disagree with us, and who take us outside our comfort zone. And boy, does that feel uncomfortable, right? But that's what I like to call positive human collisions. And I encourage each of you to go out into your world to connect with people at the end of this session today who you've not spoken to before. Don't just hang out with the people you came with. Make some positive human collisions and you'll find out that you have so much more in common than you ever believed possible. What is the diversity measure of your network? And how can you increase that? Maybe that could be part of your 2020 resolution. Just going back to a slide I missed there, Yavel Noah Harari, who's read his books. Incredible books, highly recommended. But he says that the most important thing for the future is to invest in emotional intelligence and mental balance to build a more flexible personality because the hardest changes are going to be psychological. So all of this really matters to me because in that image there, on the left, far left, is my grandfather, Carl Dordick. The, far, the furthest lady to the right with the white scarf is my grandmother. They came to Vienna as Polish artist emigres in the 1920s and they fell in love as young students do. And they used to go on their dates to the local museum or art gallery. And one particularly rainy Sunday, my grandmother, who was an artist and my grandfather, a very well-known sculptor, said, well, Carl, what if someone was to invent a little umbrella? I'm always leaving my umbrella behind in the art gallery, in the cloakroom. You know, what if someone was to invent a little umbrella? Let's keep this a secret. So she went round all the old lampshade shops. And you remember those old-fashioned lampshades with spokes? She collected all of them. And you can see her there with a little handbag on the bench there. And she tried and failed with this precious idea for many months, trying, failing, never working notes. Today I did this, it didn't work, but tomorrow I'm gonna to try that. Trying and failing, trying and failing. 
And I like to think of the word fail as first attempt in learning. So in September 1929, my grandmother Slava Horowitz Dordig invented the very first foldable umbrella, right? The exact one that all of you might have in your bag today in case we have a rain dance and it rains and helps the fire situation in Australia, though we don't like all the hail. But <laughs> nevertheless, my grandmother did that. And she should have been very rich and I shouldn't even have to work today. <laughs> but um, what happened was that was manufactured in Vienna until 1939 and in 1939 the Nazis came into Vienna. My family is Jewish and I don't have time to tell you today the incredible story of their escape. But it's a miracle that I'm standing here. I'm the most fortunate person. But very briefly, my grandfather bribed a border guard for three passages out to Switzerland. My mum was three months old at the time. They got out. But two days later, the Nazis knocked at the doors of other relatives of ours and they took them all away, never to be seen again. So all of us are here by sheer miracle. And I feel such a sense of gratitude for being here on this planet and I'm very grateful to be here and sharing with all of you this morning. It means a lot. And there you go. <laughs> so next time you look at your brolly, think of my nana. And if you want to go and visit the Dordic Museum in Malvern East, you can go and see the prototypes of the first foldable umbrella and my grandparents' work. It's open to the public. And you can see her working notes, and I encourage you to do that. So. I think some of these questions, and you're welcome to take photos, will mark the fault line between who gets ahead and who, who gets left behind in this incredibly fast-moving world. And I'm not going to go through them all now, but perhaps the one that my grandmother said, what could exist or be happening that's not happening right now? You know, that imaginative question. And... Another one I really like. How can I become a lifelong learner, unlock optim optimum human potential, improve my agility, creativity, resilience, generosity, and empathy? So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I don't have time. It's a short talk today, and I do a lot of longer keynotes, so I'm skating through things. And I'm not going to tell you that much about this second charity of mine with one voice because it's on my TED talk and I encourage you to watch it and share it. It's nearly at 100,000 views, so I want to get it to a million views if I can. But basically, I decided it would be awesome if we could bring together the neuroscientific benefits of singing with the power of positive human collisions to alleviate loneliness and social isolation. So I set up With One Voice 11 years ago, and we now have 30 With One Voice choir programs around Australia, heading to a target of 40 by the end of 2020. We bring together people of all different backgrounds, teachers, lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs, people like you, with people who are less fortunate, migrants, job seekers, people with depression and disabilities, of all faiths and backgrounds, aged nine to 90. We come together and we sing, but we don't just sing. We share supper and we share a wish list. And people can make wishes to one another for whatever they need in life. The incredible thing about these programs is they bring together haves and have nots. Most self social welfare put lumps people of a particular disadvantage into a group together, like put all the elderly people in a program together, all the people with disabilities together, all the migrants together. But this is about building a bridge between people, helping people to move away from their walls and realising that we're all on a continuum together. And the person in the wheelchair, they could be me. They could be you. It's just the luck of the draw. And all of us could have a life event that means that we go down into a spiral of negativity. And we're going to need a community to support us, which is why it's so great and why I'm here today, because I really think that innovations like this are fantastic. And I really support Jeremy and the team in that. So, did you know we that have, over 45... Oh, sorry, I'm just going to back on that for one second. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot about that. 
Just um, so Creativity Australia in the With One Voice program, I urge you, go look at my TED talk, spread the word, watch to the end, you'll see a really powerful video. But Jeremy particularly wanted me to focus a little bit on mental health today and my new charity, which I founded with my husband just a year ago called Mind Medicine Australia. So I'm just going to go into a quick video about that and then tell you a little bit about it. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. I can't sleep. I don't. Everything feels flat and grey. I feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder, with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry, and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again, with proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. Subject to forthcoming clinical trial results, we will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. incredible challenge and incredible opportunity that we have to help the millions of people in Australia who are suffering with mental illness. Who here in this room knows someone that is suffering from a mental illness? And if that's you, that's fine. Just let's all put up our hands because I bet we all do, right? So, ooh, some, oh, there we are. So this is our strategy, awareness and knowledge building. So talking at events like this, we have screenings, so we have our first anniversary screenings in February, we invite you along. We're having a major international medical summit in November in Melbourne with the world's leading researchers and psychiatrists and ethicists and anthropologists in this space. The therapist training, the centre of excellence. And we're even looking at creating, well, could we grow some of these medicines in Australia and create manufacturing facilities? So who had heard of psychedelic assisted therapies before today? That's good. Excellent. So here we are. One in five Australian adults have a mental illness today. One in two of us will have a mental illness in our lifetime. One in eight of us are on antidepressants. And one in four older adults are on antidepressants. The comorbidity around this is enormous, leads to homelessness, unemployment, suicide, and of course the suicide rates are increasing and the cost is massive. And our current treatment options aren't working for the majority of people, which is why the stats are rising. So antidepressants, as many of you would know, have massive side effects, they're hard to get off, and the remission rates are actually pretty low. Psychotherapy, you have to stick to it regularly, it's costly, and a lot of people relapse. And yet, now there's this option where with two to three doses combined with a short course of psychotherapy, we're seeing 
remissions in the range of 70 to 80 per cent through the trials globally, which is pretty extraordinary. So we're particularly focused on psilocybin, medicinal psilocybin and medicinal MDMA. And this is not the rave party music festivals MDMA, adulterated by other substances. This is pure, and we're only talking about therapeutic environments. So with just those two to three dose sessions, it's pretty incredible, and these medicines have now been given breakthrough therapy status by the FDA and could become prescribable medicines in the next couple of years. How exciting is that? Imagine. So here is a little bit about the way that these medicines are used in a medically controlled environments. So there you can see a hospital room that's been made more comfortable, two therapists, the patient's wearing an eye mask and has headphones on and is listening to a beautiful playlist. Many, many people describe these sessions as either the most important and most meaningful experience in their life or definitely in the, oh, or definitely in the top five most meaningful experiences in their lives. And by the way, no one's watching and uh, we don't know where you took it, but I'm just curious to know if anyone has tried psychedelic therapy in an intentional way. So not just at a rave party, but in an intentional way as a sacrament. Yeah? Quite a few of you have. Don't worry, there's no police here. And I have too. Obviously, I wouldn't have started a charity like this unless I had actually experienced these medicines. And you can see an AFR article on how my husband and I did this in Holland. And, you know, I have trauma in my DNA, right? My family, most of it was lost in the Holocaust. And though I wasn't there, that is epigenetically in my cells. So all of us carry trauma, even if it's not in our own life, it could be in our parents' or grandparents' lives. And so these sessions connect you to yourself, they give you a sense of oneness to all, and they help you to move out of your set patterns of thinking, which is really powerful. And this is really interesting research that was done by researchers at Melbourne Uni last year, which shows the relative safety of different drugs. And it's not based on quantity of use. It's based on the experience of first responders in, tr in treating patients in emergency. So alcohol is the most dangerous drug. In the blue is harm to self, in the red is harm to others. Down the bottom there you see psilocybin, mushrooms, and MDMA ecstasy. Now, we're focused on therapeutic use, but it's interesting to see how we got things all wrong. When Nixon did his prohibition on drugs in 1970, he should have outlawed alcohol, <laughs> not the other things, right? So. What the interesting thing is, is antidepressants have an effect size of about 0.3. And you can see there, for example, psilocybin for depression, 2.0 to 3.1. So the effect of these medicines is six to 10 times that of current existing treatments. So how does this work? Well, I love this diagram on the right. So on the, the far right circle is an MRI scan, a representation of an MRI scan of someone who's suffering with depression. So you can see that they're going around in their very rigid loops, rigid thinking patterns, like I'm not good enough, I'm ashamed, I'm afraid of the future, things are never going to work out for me, no one loves me. And then on the left circle, you see what happens with the intervention of psilocybin. This massive neurogenesis of neural pathways, a little like singing, Neuroplasticity, so you're creating neural, new, new neural pathways as well. And you're breaking out of your repetitive and rigid styles of thinking. So when you have these medicines under therapeutic circumstances, you're bypassing what's called the default mode of your brain. The other incredible thing about these medicines is that the remissions increase over time. With most medicines, people get maybe a little uplift, but then often decrease and have to double their dose. So that's also incredible. And in a MAPS phase two trial with 105 
patients who had treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder for 18 years. 51%, 52% went into remission immediately and 68% after a year using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. By the way, with the two films that we're showing on the 19th of Feb at Nova Cinema, which there's some brochures of at the back, we've got a whole lot of info at the back on all the different things that I am involved in. Um, we'll be showing Fantastic Fungi, which is about psilocybin, and Trip of Compassion, which is about MDMA therapy. And you get actually in the therapy room in an Israeli hospital and see this therapy taking place and see three patients who are severely traumatised becoming totally healed. It's so powerful. So the results are breaking through, and as you saw in the video, the medicines are now being trialled for a whole range of different conditions, including addictions. So people say, but aren't these drugs addictive? And the answer is no in medically controlled environments, and in general, they're not. And they're actually being used to help drug addicts and alcohol addicts. They're now being trialled and researched in universities and hospitals all over the world. And there's been 110 recent clinical trials with no adverse events. The medicines, as most researchers describe them, are stunningly safe. And you can see this massive renaissance now of trials happening. We've just part-funded the first trial, which is taking place at St Vincent's at the moment for people who have end-of-life depression or anxiety due to a terminal diagnosis. And as you saw in that video, well, as you probably all know, these medicines have been used forever, since ancient Greek and Roman and South America in, in Mexico. And they, were, they healed over 40,000 patients successfully in the 50s and 60s. Many people consider Nixon's act to be the greatest censorship in the history of medical science ever. And if you think of the past 50 years and an increasing mental illness epidemic and what these medicines could have done to heal our planet, it is a crime against humanity. Stan Groff, who's a famous psychiatrist, said psychedelics would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. So what are we going to do about it, ladies and gentlemen? What are we going to do about it? We want you to join our movement. Talk about it, talk to your GPs, your politicians, come to our events, come to our summit. If you can, donate and support us. It doesn't have to be a large amount. But together, we can change the world. We have this international summit. You're invited. And I want to leave you with a couple of quotes. Muhammad Ali, who said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. And five summary points for you to think about. Diversity, go out and have positive human collisions. Fail, embrace failure, learn from it. Go into your right brain headspace as often as possible. Ask questions, what if, why not? Imagine if, just like my grandma, and don't be silenced. I wish for a world where I can is more important than IQ and where we're measured by what we give, not by what we get. My favourite quote by Rabbi Hillel who said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So, I want to say thank you so much. It's been an honour and a pleasure. Thank you.